Ever since the first flyer lifted a man into the air, the dream has been to build bigger and bigger aircraft. This is the latest, the C-5 Galaxy, big enough to carry two helicopters, six buses, or 100 cars. Its cargo hold is longer than the length of the Wright brothers' first flight. It's truly a giant of the air. Throughout aviation's lifetime, aircraft have been used as beasts of burden. The military especially have always needed a flying truck. Today, this is the workhorse of the skies, the C-130, the ubiquitous Hercules, flown by almost every air force in the Western world. It'll do anything you ask it to do. It's a forgiving airplane. From a pilot's point of view, it handles remarkably well. You have an empathy with the machine. I've flown it now for nearly 5,000 hours, and I can't think of anything else that I'd prefer to fly. It's nicknamed the Fat Albert, certainly in the RAF, and I think all over the world. The Hercules and its type of aircraft allow an air force to move men and machinery relatively quickly to anywhere in the world, which gives the Air Force and the Army commanders a, a flexibility which not many aeroplanes can offer them. In war, the C-130 has proved itself a tough and reliable friend. In 1968 in Vietnam, nearly 100 C-130s flew in supplies to a force of U.S. Marines cut off and besieged in Khe Sanh by the North Vietnamese Army. For 77 days, the Hercules was Khe Sanh's lifeline. In peace, too, the C-130 has shown its mettle. In the Ethiopian famine, thousands of families were dying of starvation. They needed food desperately and they needed it at once. Initially, our mission in Ethiopia was to move grain from the port of Asab to the two airstrips at Michaeli and Axum. We later expanded that to use the aircraft to its, its most capable, uh, which was in the air drop roll, and to reach the people that possibly needed the food more than anybody else who was stuck way out in the highlands. The terrain is quite unbelievable. You're talking about the Grand Canyon on a fantastic scale. Highlands up to 10,000 feet that simply can't be reached by any other form of transport. Certainly not at the time that we could do it. We could do a three quarter of an hour flight with 20 tons of grain on board. But the same journey would take a lorry two weeks. I had briefed the mission. I knew what was expected and what we had to do. It seemed quite straightforward, 15 feet, above the ground, four tons of grain, push it out of the back and go around again, do it again. And then you arrive at Ajibar West, 10,000 feet above sea level, very mountainous indeed. There's a 200 foot ravine just before the, the drop zone, which means getting 15 feet right as you go over the lip is, is going to be difficult. Tremendous feeling of exhilaration. Navigator calls the red on, the loads pushed to the rear of the aircraft, and then with green on, out it goes. The 
My memory of Ethiopia, without a doubt, is the most satisfying and exhilarating time of my life. We went out there with an opportunity to do something. Within five days of arriving there, we knew that people were getting the food that we were delivering to them. You could see them eating it. And I don't think anybody could be failed to be moved by that. I certainly wasn't. For 30 years, the workman like Hercules has proved just how useful a flying truck can be. In World War I, strategists had seen the need for large airplanes to bomb, to transport, to carry freight. But engines in those days were just not powerful enough to lift the aircraft and a heavy cargo. A 500-pound bomb was the most this Handley Page 0400 could carry. Designers tried various ways to get around the problem. In 1921, the Italian Caproni built this monster, the triple hydro triplane, to see if a larger wing area was the answer. It flew twice before it was abandoned. For the moment, the airship was the only practicable air transport and the Germans led the field with their Zeppelins. But in 1929, a former Zeppelin designer, Claude Donnier, believed the future lay with flying boats and designed this, the DOX, the largest airplane the world had ever seen. Because the engines were not very powerful, the aircraft needed 12 of them. The DOX made several stately trips across the Atlantic. Inside, it had the space luxury and service of a grand hotel. On one of its flights, it took off with 150 passengers, 10 crew, and nine stowaways. But its design was impractical. Fully loaded, it could only fly at a height of 500 feet. As a commercial venture, it was a hopeless proposition and only three were ever built. This was another German pioneering giant, the Junkers G-38. It had some novel features, including cabins in the wings for its passengers. But so much of its engine power was needed to lift the aircraft that despite its size, it could carry only 34 people. What air transport needed was something more effective. And this is the aircraft Germany came up with. Junkers 52, nicknamed in German Tarnty U, or Anti Junkers, was among the most famous of all transport aircraft. Nearly 5,000. In the 30s, Lufthansa and many of the world's airlines used it to carry passengers. It remained in service for 40 years. But its greatest role was to be the transport airplane of Germany's Luftwaffe. It was a terrific plane. It was built entirely of metal by Junkers and was such a safe plane that as a pilot he had the feeling of being in a very comfortable limousine. It was a herrliches feeling 
It was a great feeling, as a passionate flyer anyway, to fly this kind of plane, even into danger. You could rely on it, it was safe, it could be flown blind and did not need a large landing ground. Nineteen thirty six and the start of the Spanish Civil War. For the first time, the world saw the decisive impact of air transport. Junkers 52s airlifted 10,000 Moroccan troops from Africa to Spain in support of Franco and changed the course of the war. Six years later, the Junkers ushered in another military revolution in the battle for Crete. Crete war der it was the first big operation with the Junkers 52 in a role we had specially rehearsed, namely the dropping of paratroops. We knew that Crete was very strongly fortified, so we had to land taking advantage of the element of surprise. Although there were other smaller operations, Crete was the first major airborne assault and it was well protected. There were over 200 Junkers 52s taking part that morning as we flew towards Crete at a height of 120 meters in solid lines of aircraft, one after another, like a chain. We carried many hundreds of paratroops ready to jump. We were greeted with a hail of ground fire. The English shot at our machines from all sides. It was a terrible experience. The battle was a close-run thing. The Germans dropped 3,000 paratroopers, who after a bitter fight captured the airfield. 22,000 more troops were then flown in to snatch a victory. But 170 Junkers 52s were shot down in the operation. For all its strengths, the plane was not big enough to carry the guns and armor so vital for a modern battle. This was the Allies' equivalent of the Junkers 52. It's the C-47, the military version of the DC-3. 10,000 of these workhorses were built and some are still in harness today. During the war, they carried everything and went everywhere. They gave commanders a new dimension, mobility. Air transport had become an essential element of waging war. The war in Yugoslavia was particularly bitter, fought between Tito's partisans and a ruthless German occupying army. The only effective link the partisans had with their American and British allies was by air. Tito was very grateful for all the help we were able to give, uh, both uh, sort of drop, supply drops, airstrikes, and uh, in a way, most of all, airlifts taking out wounded and sometimes civilians who were in a bad way. The uh, Germans, on principle, massacred all partisan wounded that they managed to capture. And that meant that the partisans had to carry around the wounded with them. That deprived them of their mobility, which is one of the most important things in guerrilla warfare. The Allied aircraft flew from bases at the foot of Italy and came to be known as the Balkan Air Force. The first thing, of course, to do when we were expecting an airlift it was to get all the wounded assembled. Now, that wasn't very easy because they came from the mountains all around with um, some walking, some on uh, whatever ponies we had. 
and they had to be brought in probably a day or two before. And then the moment the aircraft landed, put on board as fast as we could and taken off again because uh, there was always a danger uh, that the Germans would get onto this and sh shoot them up. I think it was uh, enormously important from several points of view, very important from a human point of view because they felt awfully alone in one way and uh, this meant that there was some hope for them that somebody was looking after them. Very important from a military point of view because, of course, if you knew that you were going to um, be massacred by the Germans if you were wounded, it was very bad for morale. A lot of the wounded were people I knew personally, and I found enormous satisfaction myself in being able to help in this way. There's no doubt at all that what we were able to do in the way of airlifting out wounded and so on is something that the Yugoslavs have always remembered, always been grateful for, and which has been a very solid foundation for friendship between our two countries. On the other side of the world, in China, there was another group of fighters relying on the C-47. These were the Flying Tigers, American volunteer pilots flying Kitty Hawks against the Japanese in support of the Chinese army. The only way these pilots could be supplied with the food, ammunition and equipment they needed was from India by air. The roads were held by the Japanese. This meant a long flight over the Himalayas to China. Flying over the hump, it was called. And naturally, the first aircraft selected to carry out this arduous mission was the C-47. When we took off from India, the uh, elevation was 4,000. Of course, uh, it was hot. We wore khakis there and our little leather jacket, and of course we climbed up to altitudes. I mean, the temperature would be below zero. It'd be so cold, you'd have to sit on your hands to keep them warm. The C-47 did the job until we got a better aircraft over there, but it was not an ideal one because we ran out of power before we could get up to the altitude. It was made to fly below 10,000 feet. And we were flying at 17 to 19,000 with 5,000 pounds of cargo on it. On a clear day, the hump was beautiful. But if you thought about it a minute and if you had to bail out, which some folks did, and walk out of there, it could have been uh, horrible. Finally, the C-47s were replaced with a bigger aircraft, the C-46. But even these were too small for the equipment of modern war. At that time, only the Germans had developed the technology to design really big airplanes. And they had already built another giant. After it had been recognized that the Junkers 52 was not suitable for transporting large cargoes, it was thought necessary to build a giant glider, the ME-321. It would then be possible to effect landings on a much grander scale than before. As a landing in England was then being planned, we hastened to build this massive glider, rated to carry one of our 20-ton pencils and deliver it right up to the battlefront.
The Messerschmitt 321 was so huge that it needed three planes to tow it and had rockets under each wing to assist its takeoff. When the invasion of England was called off, the glider concept was abandoned. Instead, the decision was taken to put engines on the aircraft. First they tried four, but these were not powerful enough to lift the monster. In the end, six were needed. Appropriately, it was named Gigant, German for giant, and 200 were built. As I stood for the first time under this bird, my heart sank. I had no idea how this aircraft could possibly fly. A steel frame with fabric wrapped around it. At the beginning, I did not have much faith in it. It was the same for all my comrades, but that was soon to change. And slowly grew the certainty, trust and faith in the aircraft. It was an extremely good aircraft and performed extremely well. The plane could carry a maximum of 18 tons. It could take people, soldiers, 120 with full pack, up to tanks, armored vehicles, anti-aircraft guns, with gun carriages, fuel of course, and all kinds of small transport vehicles. Almost anything that the other aircraft, because of size and weight, could not carry. This was, generally speaking, the reason why this huge transporter was needed. The fighting in North Africa was going badly for the Germans. The Africa Corps, harassed by the British, desperately needed supplies. But the Mediterranean Sea was controlled by the Allies. The only way to get vital materials across to Africa was by air. It was a job for the newly built Gigant. We took off at 9 o'clock our time, flew first west, roughly level with Rome, then turned towards Sardinia and towards Algeria. We were three machines together. It was a beautiful day. Suddenly, without warning, the shooting began. I had no idea whether it was our gunners behind me in the fuselage, or perhaps our mechanics or radio operator. But I soon found out it was an enemy aircraft. We suddenly saw these three numbering aircraft in front of us. The, the microphones had crackled open, and... Uh, the adrenaline had started to flow and everyone was a bit jumpy and uh, but then we realised that they were in fact 3 to 3s we'd seen them many times before. So we gradually closed on them to attack. And then as we drew level with them, the mid-upper gunner started to open fire and we could see the tracers pouring into him. I could see the shots rushing past me, to the right, to the left of the cockpit, and a few seconds later I knew that we had been damaged. Suddenly, great lump came off the mid-upper section and he keeled over and, and went straight into the sea. I must have blacked out for a few seconds when we hit. When I came to, everything was burning. The oil was burning. Of the marauder, I could see nothing. The Gigant was slow and vulnerable. Yet in its day, it could boast of being the biggest operational aircraft in the world. But across the Atlantic, the Americans were designing an airplane ten times as big. The aim was to build an aircraft that could carry troops and tanks over the Atlantic, where German U-boats were wreaking havoc on the Allied convoys. And the man contracted by the U.S. Department of Defense to design and build this mighty aircraft was also a larger-than-life figure. Millionaire, tycoon, Howard Hughes.
pilot, plane maker, film producer, perfectionist. Hughes was a man who thought big, but paid attention to the smallest detail. This habit caused delays from the start. Though the contract was signed in November of 1942, it was 44 before construction got underway. By then, the U-boat threat had been beaten, and the plane was no longer needed. Probably the most remarkable thing about it was that it was one of the largest airplanes ever built of wood, completely of wood. The only uh, metal in that was metal fittings and uh, things like uh, engine mounts and engines and that sort of thing. And of course, uh, hydraulic system, the controls and the tubing. But basically the whole structure was wood and uh, beautifully done, just beautiful cabinet work in it. Hughes' constant changes of mind and interference slowed down work on the aircraft. Washington finally had had enough and canceled the project. But a vigorous lobbying campaign by Hughes won a concession, the government's agreement that one airplane could be completed. Two years later, the sections of the flying boat were ready to be moved to their assembly site at Long Beach. Well, at the beginning of the move, the moving crew were the most efficient crew I had ever seen. They didn't seem to have to talk to each other. They Each one knew exactly what he had to do. They obviously were going very slowly, and the streets were just lined with people. So as they went down the roads, they had to, first of all, clear traffic, and secondly, take down telephone wires and then put them right back up. All during this time, there were just no hitches. This crew knew exactly what to do. It's just perfection. And when they got the thing onto the site, I don't think they even put a scratch on it. It's just fantastic. It was built large because Howard didn't like to build anything normal. It had to be the biggest or the smallest or the fastest or the slowest. We started as a target to fly a 50-ton tank. Now that has to be pretty good size. He was a perfectionist, but he couldn't uh, make up his mind. He wanted to keep hassling around until he got the absolute best. He sat in the cockpit for hours and hours and hours, moving his little parts around to get the instrument panel just the way he wanted it. But as a man, I enjoyed working with him very much. The continuing delays caused rumblings in Washington. The construction had swallowed vast sums of public money. Hughes was summoned to a Senate committee investigating the project. Its chairman, Senator Brewster, was on the warpath. You do solemnly swear in the matter now pending before this committee. But in front of the film cameras, Howard Hughes was in fighting form. Senator, may I ask a question? Well, now, if you'll just wait till I issue a subpoena for Mr. Mars, I've asked you whether or not you would produce him, and you said you didn't know, as I understand. I don't remember if that was my answer. Well, what was your answer? I don't remember. Get it off the record. Well, now, Mr. Hughes, I'm asking you what your answer was. Don't and we're not going to was. have this bickering back and forth. You are before this committee, and you're going to answer the question. You asked me just now uh, about a reply that I made. My answer is I don't remember. Now, the man is well, taking I'll it down now. Again. Ask him. What? Will you bring Mr. Mars in at the 2 o'clock session? Uh, I, no, I don't think I will. Will you try to bring him in? No, I don't think I'll try. I've put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it, and I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back, and I mean it. On November the 1st, 1947, the giant flying boat was finally ready. Hughes prepared to take it out on taxing trials. The aircraft was officially named the Hercules, but already it was known by everyone as the Spruce Goose. Obviously flying crept into all of our minds because of the Senate investigation and the impact it would have. I was sitting in the co-pilot seat. We had, I think, four uh, newspaper reporters aboard, and of course the Hughes crew. There were about 40 people aboard when we started to taxi. 
In the first taxi run, Howard had us looking out the windows and uh, looking for logs and debris, and the only one who saw anything at all was Howard. <laughs> he had better eyes than we did. And that run was you know, about 35, 40 miles an hour, and everything seemed to be functioning well. After another faster run, Hughes prepared the crew for one more go. And then he kind of casually turned to me and he told me to put the flaps down 15 degrees and uh, that's takeoff position. <laughs> he was surprised when it took off. And uh, he recovered rapidly from the surprise and executed a beautiful landing. But his first words when we hit the water was, boy, those flaps balloon this thing. <laughs> I think Howard intended to lift it off a few feet just to prove that it would fly. But I don't think he really intended to lift it off as high as he did. I was alone with him. We are riding back to LA. And I said, Howard, did you mean to take that off today? And he looked at me, you'll never know. <laughs> and I don't know to this day. I don't think anybody else does. The Spruce Goose never flew again. But it remains to this day the biggest aircraft ever built. With peace in Europe came the Cold War, reaching flashpoint in Berlin. The city lay marooned in the heart of East Germany, accessible from the west only by specified roads, or along three air corridors. In 1948, the Russians closed the roads and enforced a blockade. In response, America and Britain launched a massive airlift to supply the western sectors of Berlin. The city needed 5,000 tons of provisions daily just to survive. Everything had to be flown in. Soon, aircraft were making a 1,000 landings a day. That air corridor was just like a jammed up freeway. Take off, and you knew right behind you was a string of aircraft, just like they're on one continuous string. As you'd make a turn where you could look at it, you'd see airplanes coming up off Rhine Mine in a steady stream. And up ahead of you, you could see the airplanes above you and below you. And you knew it was very important to maintain that airspeed, or you'd have some problems somewhere. Coming into Berlin and looking down, it happened to be a daytime on my first arrival. And looking at the city from the air, it was, it was just remarkable to me because all it was it looked like a cemetery of buildings. There were shells and uh, uh, buildings. You could see right on down the foundations from the rooftops. And the, the devastation there was, was something I just wasn't prepared for. Well, we came over with about four airplanes. And I didn't know how many other airplanes were in the pipeline, but to supply a city of two and a half million people with, with their warmth needs, with the needs for any meaningful employment, let alone the food requirements, it was a question in my mind that we could pull off anything like that. As soon as I arrived at Gatow, I was sent as part of the British team operating with the Americans a special surveillance radar. The radar made a constant flow of aircraft to the airfields possible and enable them to maintain a landing rate about one every 90 seconds. I maintain your present elevation and continue vector 315. Now I remember one Dakota captain complaining all the way in that he couldn't maintain height and that his controls were sloppy. When he arrived at Gatar, he made a fairly heavy landing and it was only then he discovered that instead of his three and a half ton load that he should have had as a Dakota, someone had inadvertently given him a York load of 10 tons. The aircraft flew in on the northern and southern air corridors and flew out on the western one. They landed at one of three airports in the western sector or on Berlin's lakes. The schedule was relentless. Airplanes arriving and taking off in a continuous chain. 
If a pilot missed his landing, he had no second chance. He had to fly out immediately. Sometimes, things went wrong. The airlift lasted 15 months, clocking up more than a quarter of a million flights and delivering nearly two and a half million tons of supplies. Triumphantly successful, it forced the Russians to lift their blockade and it raised the morale of the Berliners, beginning a new partnership between Victor and Vanquished. One American captain flying into Tempelhof got the habit of dropping his spare um, chewing gum packets out to the children gathered underneath. And of course, no time at all, his aircraft got recognized. And I believe that the children used to call him the Candy Bomber. I was trying to keep it a secret because you weren't supposed to drop things out of airplanes. Bombs are okay, maybe, but not, not candy and gum. Well, I knew that we'd have to parachute the things so that the kids would be able to see them. And so I took just ordinary handkerchief and made parachutes just like the handkerchief in the rock trick. Tied the candy bars and chewing gum on these strings, rolled them up, and then we'd push them out the flare chute. That's how I got to be known as the candy bomber or Uncle of Wiggly Wings, as some have said. British people sent all kinds of goodies, and the Americans sent a lot, ran out of handkerchiefs right away, and the people started to send those. The kids in Berlin started to send back theirs for refills. The international press had to put out that I was a bachelor, which I was at that time. But when that word got out, the parachutes started coming, the black lace, perfumed, had all kinds of handkerchiefs. Then one day we came, and there was kids all over the ramp. And I don't know how the word got out that I might even be there, but they asked questions and pretty soon they identified me and came out of the hold and there they were, the whole ramp was filled with them. The thing I remembered best about the Berlin Airlift that feels good to me is working together with people we tried to destroy. And here it was, in Berlin, the scene of some of the most devastating bombing and the British, the Americans, the French, pulling together with these same people that we're trying to destroy to save their life. The Berlin airlift showed once again how useful a really big airplane would be. The British were already building one. The eight-engine Bristol Brabazon, the largest land plane ever built in the United Kingdom. Like all its predecessors, though, it did not have enough power and was soon abandoned. This Leviathan of an airplane, the consolidated XC-99, was successful enough to be used by the United States Air Force as a carrier of especially large cargoes. But only one was ever built. What these big aircraft needed to operate effectively was more power. And with the invention of the jet engine, finally they got it. Designers of aircraft always want more power, but they also want lower fuel consumption. And a propeller was just about at the end of its line. There couldn't be any more further thrust out of it. And so the invention of a jet engine was the ideal way to suddenly provide enormously more power, but also at a higher fuel consumption. The J-79 was the first engine where the fuel consumption was dropped so dramatically because of higher pressure ratio inside the engine. 20 years of development in jets had at last produced an engine that solved the power problem. It was the breakthrough that created a new generation of large airplanes. Big transporters like the C-141 Starlifter. The 
one was a very, very important airplane because it's the first time we ever designed a military strategic airlifter. The jet age brought to us what we've been looking for for so very, very long, and that is speed, long range, heavy payload. That's what airlift requires, and that's what the jet age ushered in for us, and the 141 was the first jet airplane designed to do a military airlift job, and a superb machine it is. Like the Spruce Goose, the C-141 was designed to provide a lifeline across the Atlantic. In the event, it became an air bridge over the Pacific, flying young Americans to the Vietnam War, and bringing them back alive, on stretchers, or in body bags. Vietnam would be perhaps hours of boredom interrupted by moments of extremely frightening situations. We've been in uh, doing ambush operations off a major highway northwest of Saigon. And at one point, I, I, I walked back, and as I was approaching the edge of our ambush position, an enemy soldier opened up from a concealed position and uh, got me. Thank God he was a young soldier because an AK-47 is uncontrollable on automatic fire. He didn't hold the weapon down, and uh, the entire 30-round clip was fired, of which I think one, maybe two bullets struck me, and uh, the rest went over my head. Now, the men made some sort of a poncho stretcher, and I was sort of dragged to a landing zone in a rice paddy and put on board a helicopter, taken back to a field hospital outside Saigon. After I stabilized in the hospital, I would think not more than four or five days, we boarded the C-141. But I was seriously wounded, a lot of pain, and uh, a lot of medical procedure being performed on me. I was just very, very uncomfortable. And the first real feeling of any security I had was when I saw the airplane. I knew what it was, but that was my freedom bird. That was my ride home. No one went to Vietnam thinking that they would come home seriously wounded. You thought about living, you thought about dying, the horrible things, but never about having to come back helpless. The C-141, that's where it fit in, in our experience. It was there when we needed it. There was no other way back to the States quickly. I think that the largest misconception of Vietnam was that going into combat was the worst part of the deal. It was not. Coming home was the hard part. As the Vietnam War was drawing to a close, Lockheed unveiled an even bigger aircraft. So big that just 17 of them could have carried out the entire Berlin airlift. The C-5 Galaxy.
C-5 was designed to be able to transport all elements of all Army divisions over long intercontinental distances and literally land them anywhere in the world. At the time, it was designed was the largest airplane that ever been built. And by a rather wide margin, it was about twice as heavy as a previous airplane. There are a lot of ways to characterize the C-5. One is that the main cargo compartment will hold six Greyhound buses. The fuel capacity is equal to the entire weight of a C-141. The paint on the airplane is over a ton of paint on it. And so from any way you measure it, it's, it's a, an impressively large airplane. Historically, aircraft designers have always needed more power. The C-5 was that happy circumstance in which suddenly uh, an engine was available to us with sufficient thrust and performance to make the airplane concept uh, a successful one. That engine was the TF-39, the first high bypass jet. Technology could now make real the dreams of aircraft designers. Without the tremendous power of these new engines, the C-5 would have needed 12 ordinary jets and suffered all the problems of the past. The pilot of the first test flight of the world's biggest aircraft was Leo Sullivan. I received lots of letters and quite a few phone calls asking me if I had my right senses about me in order to fly the aircraft. Some of them felt that it would never fly. We know it will never fly. God didn't mean for it to fly. Other people said that we were going to die in the aircraft because nothing that big should go in the air. We had said we'd fly uh, that morning, uh, come in at 6 o'clock, and we'd fly when the airplane was ready. taxied out to the end of the runway, and we did take off exactly at 7.47. It wasn't planned how it worked that way, and uh, it is kind of ironic in the situation that we were in where we were competitors for a program, and of course, Boeing's done beautifully with our 747 aircraft since. When you're setting up controls on the end of the runway, uh, you're thinking uh, there's quite a bit tied up in this for the future of the company. You sweat a little with your hands, push up the power and go. right where we were supposed to and flew off just as beautifully as anything in the world. Airborne. 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 Oh, good. The one thing that was very noticeable was the smoothness and the ease of which the aircraft flew. And for people who haven't flown large aircraft, they fly much easier than small ones because they're not affected by gusty, turbulent air, and they're very smooth to fly. And they're like a bowling ball going down an alley. There's not much displaces them. The C-5 represented to Mac the first opportunity to take integrated fighting forces together with their important firepower and deliver it to the point of battle. We never could do that before. So the C-5 gave us the capability of saying, okay, United States Army, United States Marines, United States Air Force, we'll move you with the firepower you need to gain and hold ground, and then we'll resupply you. In fact, it was the Israelis, pressed dangerously hard in the Yom Kippur War, who were the first to benefit from the C-5's prodigious airlifting capability. Mrs. Golda Meir, then the Prime Minister, came to our president and asked for help because their armed forces were fighting a battle of attrition, and they were going to lose, no doubt about it. And they were rapidly running out of ammunition and very badly needed supplies. The only way to stabilize it is to get in there with some equipment and some people 
to make sure that those forces engaged in battle would not be overrun. We found ourselves in a very difficult international position. We would certainly have liked to have done that airlift just with commercial airplanes. It would have been much more acceptable to the world. But we found that the commercial airlines, first of all, couldn't do it with some of the very heavy equipment. And those that did have some limited capability to do what was needed uh, were not terribly interested in it because of their relationships with not only Israel but with the Arab world. And they didn't want to get embroiled in a very, very difficult political situation. So the only people that then could do it were the, uh, was the military airlift command, our airplanes. The arms and equipment flown in by the C-5s in response to Israel's cry for help had a decisive impact on the war. It was an impressive display of what earlier military strategists had always claimed a big airplane could achieve. Yom Kippur, without any question in my mind, demonstrated the need for military airlift that is long range, high speed, responsive, and capable of carrying military equipments. And if you're going to provide that kind of capability, you must have an airplane, a military design like the C-5 to get that job done. It is a lesson others have learned. Today, the biggest operational aircraft in the world is no longer the C-5, but the Russian Antonov 124, if only by a few feet. History has shown the value of these giants of the air, and the technology of the superpowers has finally made them work. Thank you.